Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Last week, we, we started with um, uh, the precious blood of Christ, talking from 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verses 14 through 19. We will reread that passage, and then we'll go from there. Uh, as disobedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance. But it, uh, as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or lifestyle, manner of life. Now, isn't that interesting? you got people running along saying it doesn't matter how you live. You're under grace. It's just you're under grace. It doesn't matter. You're going to live the right way. That Peter took it as an uh, opportunity to encourage the church, really command the church, that... Um, but as he is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or the way or manner of life because it is written. Now, in other words, there's a reason we're to live holy. All right? What, what's that reason? Um, be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. So God says, I'm holy. You're to be holy. Peter tells us that we're not to live in the former lust of our, in our ignorance, but we are to live uh, because he, he called you as holy. So be holy in every way that you live. So we are commanded by God to live a holy life. Everybody say we're commanded. commanded. Well, if the scripture commands you to do something and it's going to happen to you automatically, why would the scripture tell you it's going to happen to do it? You know, people are going to say, oh, you're going to live that way because grace is on you. You're just going to live that way. No, the grace empowers you, but you still have to act. Be holy is an action. It's a verb. You're to do. We are to live a holy life. Well, now, before Christ, you couldn't live a holy life. But now that you're in Christ and he empowers you by his grace, you can live the holy life, but you are still to live it. You still need to do it. You can't just lay down and say, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm great. No, that, that, that just doesn't cut the mustard. All right? As one person said, it's too thin to make soup. And that's pretty thin, isn't it? I like soup. You know, all right. Um, and, if the, and if you call on the Father, who without respect the person judges, According to every man's word. Boy, I'll tell you what, people get in trouble now. We don't judge anything. God doesn't judge anything. He says he judges according to every man's work. Okay? Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear or in reverential awe or be in awe of, of displeasing God. We are to live a life not, in, not afraid I'm going to make a mistake, but in the awe of I don't want to displease God. You should be your heart not to displease. If you love God, you should not want to displease him. Or you shouldn't be looking for ways to get away with displeasing him. All right? I mean, I hear some people preach stuff. I think, my God, what, what are you talking about? Uh, it doesn't matter if you, if, you, if you get drunk. It doesn't matter if you fornicate. It doesn't matter if you smoke dope. It don't matter what you do. Because you're under grace and God loves you. And, and, and if you try not to do that, that's works. No, no, no. I don't want to displease my father. As a matter of fact, I want my lifestyle to honor him in everything I do. I want the way I talk, the way I act, the way I respond to people, the way I do things to be an honor to God so that he, that he doesn't bring reproach on him and his name because I'm his child. Now, you know, if, if you go out here and, and, and the world goes out there and, you know, we had, a, we had a presidential candidate about 20 years ago, you know, um, everybody said, oh, it's okay that he's had sex with this woman, that woman, that woman, this woman, that woman. Thank you. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, glasses show up. <laughs> Praise God. And it's okay because that's him. But let somebody else do it who, who says it's wrong, and boy, they'll take you to the cleaners. You know, there's always a double standard with the world. You know, but the fact is, as Christians, we live under a, a bigger microscope than anybody else. Now, they can say it's okay to do whatever, but the Christian does, ah, you did it. It's, it's the way the world is. We have to have a lifestyle that honors God and, de and, and demonstrates uh, that we're living in a way that pleases God. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Okay. For as, as, uh, so you spend your time sojourning here, or the way that we drift, we, we're living life here, do it in a way that honors and not displeases God. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed, now redeemed means to buy back with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, or the vain manner of life that you once lived, received by tradition from your fathers, but... Now, here's, here's, here's an antithesis. We were not redeemed with silver and gold. We weren't redeemed with the things this world has to offer. We were redeemed with something far greater. What? But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the blood of Jesus is what has redeemed us. A price, listen, a price was paid. Say, a price was paid. Far greater than anything I could ever achieve in life for my redemption. 
You can't mine enough gold. You can't get enough diamonds. You can't get enough platinum. You can't get enough titanium. You can't mine all the things of the world. You can't own Microsoft. You can't own all the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. Nothing you can get and have in wealth can redeem you from destruction. We were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, a land without spot or blemish. Now remember when the Jews had to bring their offering and sacrifice to God, it had to be a spotless or blemishless lamb. And if it wasn't, they couldn't receive it. Why? Because the allegory was that Christ came in perfection to redeem humanity. We've been redeemed. Now we're not, we're not atoned for it. Now the Old Testament word is atone, cover. But it's still there. All right? You know, you got some guests coming to the house. You got a bunch of stuff in the corner of the room. You can't do anything with it in the amount of time. You got a nice blanket. You throw it over there, drape it over there, make it look real nice like it's a piece of decoration or whatever. You've covered that junk, but that junk's still there. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, and uh, they, might go in, they might come and go and not see it, but it's still there. And you know it's still there. Hello? I mean, you're, you're, you're very aware. What you're hoping is they don't ask to see that blanket up close. Or use it, even worse, use it. Then it gets everything uncovered. <laughs> All of a sudden, the whole thing's out there. You know, but, but when, we, when we, in the old covenant, they kept getting covered and covered. They had to go every year. They had to bring blood to cover the year before and the year before, the year before, and the year, all the years before, and that current year and just covered up for another year. But the New Testament terminology is not a term. Now, I know it's using the King James, a bad translation. They, the King James translators with their theological disposition or, or, or pre, predisposition decided to go ahead and translate that word that they translate atonement, but it doesn't mean atonement. It actually does mean redemption. But because they, they're so, they were so used to that terminology, they used it. It's not, it wasn't that they did it in, in it's an era, it's, or it's, it's, you know, that you can't trust the Bible. We can go back to the Greek and look at it. They just, because they wanted to tie that to what the Old Testament was, they used that word, but it was the wrong word. Because it now it brings a wrong theological perspective. See, we're not atoned for. We're not covered. Your sins are not covered. You can't go pick up the blanket and find them. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, God said, though your sins be red as scarlet, they'll be made as white as wool. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I am he who removes your sins as far as you from the iniquity from you as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. And I will remember them no more. The New Testament terminology for the believer is not atoning, not a covering, but redemption. Now, here, here's, a, here's a legal term we can use to convey the thought of redemption. It's been expunged. All right? See, when, you know, when, you, when a, a criminal's in prison and they get pardoned, they still have a record of what they did. They've just been pardoned from it. In other words, we know what you did. We have your list of records. But down at the bottom it says pardoned. Okay? We can go find everything you did. But you've been pardoned or the, 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 the state recognizes and forgives you for what you did. But we know what you did. Now, when someone's record is expunged, it's wiped out. You can't find it. He's been expunged. From what? We don't know. Why don't you know? Because it's been wiped out. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been completely removed. You see, that's what redemption is. Your record got expunged. Everything you ever did, all the sin you ever committed. Any, you know, the only way God, anybody will find out about it is if you bring it up. Now, the devil will try to get you to bring it up. But you can say, nope, it's been expunged. I'm redeemed. I'm purchased back. Hallelujah, glory to God. I've been washed with the blood of Christ, glory to God. I no longer have to live under the, the penalty of that. I'm not just pardoned from it. It's been expunged. It's been wiped out. It's as if that man that did that never existed. <clears throat> well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 the, the, uh, and through 21, the biblical reference to that, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. One translation says a new species of being that never existed before. Well, well, how can that be? He got expunged. The man that did those things doesn't exist anymore. The man that did those things doesn't have to, that can't be charged, can't be penalized, can't be found guilty for anything that he ever did before because he's been expunged. He's been washed clean. It's been removed from him. He's been white as snow, glory to God. He's a new man in Christ, hallelujah. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. Well, we know that it's not your mind. See, when you give your life to Christ, you don't forget, who you, you don't forget your name or your address or your telephone number. 
And unfortunately, if you're 80 pounds overweight and you give your life to Christ, you're going to look in the mirror and you're still 80 pounds overweight. So it's not physical. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 or 23, one of those two says this. It says, I pray Christ your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. There are three different Greek words there. There is, I pray God your whole spirit, pneuma, soul, suke, and body, soma, be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. We just dealt with two of them. See, your soul is a seed of your intellect, your mind, your will, your, your remembrance. Well, you didn't get a new soul when you got born again. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us to fix that soul. We're to receive a meekness, the engrafted word of God, which they were to save that soul. Okay? Romans chapter 12 tells us that we are to uh, not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So the soul has a progressive change. The body. You know, the soma. Well, what happens it? We know when Christ returns, we, the corruptible shall put an incorruptible, the mortal shall put an immortality. Hallelujah. Glory to God, we'll be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. So we get a new body when Jesus comes back. But not until then. What? You still got that corruptible, uh, death-doomed, mortal body. You still have that. Jesus tarries long enough, you're going to die physically. I'm sorry, you are. Well, I'm going to be like John the Revelator. You know, he's still living on the Isle of Patmos. No, he's not. Well, Jesus said to him, what is, it if I stay, what is it to you if I have him stay until I come again? Talking to Peter, because Peter was upset that he had to be, die crucified upside down. And he asked, well, what about John? Jesus said, what about him? You do what I told you to do. What is it to you if I want him to live until I come back? And then the, John even said, and the rumor went around that they said I was going to live until he come back. That was, he, he knew it was a rumor. He knew it wasn't true. But I know Christians who, who believe that. Why? Go, oh, John's still alive somewhere. Read your Bible a little, just a little bit better. Maybe a few verses past your little thing you think you got some hot heavy revy with. All right. Somebody say glory. glory. Amen. So, so we know from the Word of God that it wasn't the soul that got saved. We know it wasn't the body that got saved. We know that there's one thing left that got born again, that got, tra that got transformed immediately upon acceptance of Christ as our Savior, and that is the spirit of man. Let me show that to you from John chapter 3. Looking in the third chapter of John. Y'all know John 3 pretty good, but let's back up just a little bit before we get to for God so loved the world part. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man doeth these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, or if you're real so, it's born to again, with a D, out of the laugh. He's been born again. Hallelujah. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And the women said what? Dear God, I hope not. Okay. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does a woman do right before she gives birth? She breaks water. That's in reference to physical birth. When Jesus said, except the man be born of water, he's talking about physical and of the spirit. That's talking about what? Pneuma. That's the part of man that, did, that we didn't get renewed. It's part of man that doesn't get changed when Jesus comes back. That's the third part left over. The spirit part. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say, ye must be born again. So here we have it. Jesus clearly telling us, the word of God clearly telling us, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. It's talking and making reference to the pneuma or the spirit of man. Everybody said that means woe man too. All right. So man and woman... When you're born again, you get a new spirit. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And all things are of God, verse 18 says. Jump down to verse 21. For he hath made him sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now we're brought into a place of right relationship, right standing, right 
uh, place with God. The word righteousness is an old English word that means to be in right relationship with, or right standing with, having a proper relationship with. Our Bill of Rights was originally entitled the Bill of Righteousness. We were, that, every, now listen, everybody goes, I got rights. No, it was the Bill of Righteousness. When you're in right relationship with the government, how many know that felons can't carry guns? Legally. They can't fly airplanes. You don't have a freedom of a whole lot of things when you're a felon. When you're incarcerated, you don't have freedom of speech. You don't have the right to bear arms. You don't have the, I mean, you, don't have, you, don't, you can't vote. I mean, all kinds of stuff you can't do. Why? Because you're no longer righteous. You're no longer in right relationship with the government. Okay? And that's what it means. When we were brought into, when we made the righteousness of God in Christ, we came into right relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. Why? Because he became our, Jesus became our substitute. Jesus paid the price. His blood was shed that we might be made right with God. Oh, glory to God. Aren't you glad we've been made right with God? I'm glad I've been made right with God. Hallelujah. And so people come along and say, oh, yeah, there's none righteous. No, not one. I got Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Read the whole thing, dummy. He starts out Romans chapter 3, verse 1, talking about that the Jew and the Gentile, and he starts putting, paralleling, you know, th does the Jew have an advantage? Well, yeah, because it's got the covenants and so forth. Then he gets down to verse 9 and says this, but we've concluded this one thing. All, Jew and Gentile, are under sin, are guilty before God. And then he goes on in about, about eight verses or so and quotes, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. There's none that seeks after God. There, there's none that eschews evil. Their mouth is full of poison, like an asp. And they go on and on and on. And then he gets down. See, what happens here is he's talking about the law. He says, what, whatever the law says, it says to them that are under the law. That was to, to, to verify and conclude and bring people to this place, man outside of Christ, whether you're a Jew in the natural lineage of Abraham, whether you're a Gentile outside the natural lineage of Abraham, it doesn't matter. You are guilty before God. But to see, here, here's the good news. See, people say, if you say that, your big people feel bad. No, no, no. You got to locate people so you can fix them. How would, you like, how would you like to go to the doctor? And you say, well, doc, I'm hurt. And he, and he goes, well, I don't want to ask you where because I'll make you feel bad by asking you where. I'm just going to work on you all over. No, 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 no. I'm not hurting all over. See, people come up with some of the dumbest things. But Romans 3, verse 19, you know, we, just, we talked about all this. Now, we know that what things the law, so of the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped. Well, in other words, God has things that say, you know, outside of Christ, the law has buried. And when the law says you're not, you're not righteous, outside of Christ, you are not righteous. You can't come and say, well, you know what? I gave a million dollars to the church last week. That and a cup of coffee from Starbucks will still get you in hell. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. There is, you can't buy your way in. There is none righteous, no, not one. But the implication, and when we, we'll find out right here, is that is outside of Christ. Well, how do you know? Because the, the, every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, one guy said one time, he said, when you see the word therefore, check out and find what it's there for. All right? Therefore, by the deeds of the law. Here's what Paul is saying. All that, none righteous, no, not one, and all that, is the, under the law, nobody. 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 All right. Is righteous. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even, or that is, even what even here means that is, the, um, the righteousness of God, which is what? By faith of Jesus Christ, listen to who it goes to, unto all and upon all them that believe, that, and here, here is the implication, Jew and Gentile, for there is no difference. So verse 10, for somebody to come along and take chapter, chapter 3, verse 10 and go, uh, when you say, well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. No, there's no righteousness, no, not one. Romans says so. They didn't read far enough. How do you know? Because he said now, when, when is manifest? But now the righteousness of God is manifested to who? Unto all and upon all them that believe. Well, how many are believers? Oops, excuse me, sorry. I'm a believer. Are you a believer? 
Well, if you're a believer, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've confessed Him as Lord and believed in your heart God raised Him from the dead, then unto you and upon you came the righteousness of God that is by faith in Jesus Christ. You are now righteous. No, there's no righteousness. Read your Bible. Some people get so hung up they won't even read the Bible. Because somebody told them, there's no righteousness, no, not one. You know? All them faith people, they're out there saying they're righteous. They ain't right. Well, I say it because I read my Bible. I didn't stop in verse 10. I, listen, if you read all that, then I don't love God. I don't, I don't seek after God. I could ask that same person, do you seek after God? Oh, yes, I do. Well, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Romans says you don't. He says none seeketh after God. You, do you understand anything? Yeah, I understand a lot. No, the Bible says none understandeth. See, when you take things out of context and don't read the full context to it, you can say a whole lot of things that aren't biblically accurate. Outside of Christ, you can't understand. Outside of Christ, you truly can't seek God. Outside of Christ, your mouth is full of poison. Outside of Christ, nobody does good. Outside of Christ, there is none righteous. But I'm now a believer. And because of my faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that he procured for me through his substitutionary work has come unto and upon me. I am now clothed in the garment of righteousness. I turned in mine. My garments, are as right, my garments of righteousness are as filthy rags. But I'm not approaching God in them. I'm coming in the garments of righteousness that Jesus has given unto me. I'm in Christ. I show up in His. Hallelujah. It's not my work. It's His work. The work that I accomplish is the work of faith. I live by faith and not by sight. Glory to God. I accept what He did. I receive what He did. I act and can carry out works of righteousness because of what He is in me. Glory to God. I'm not trying to get to God by doing things. I'm, de I'm just demonstrating that God's in me by what I do. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, see, that some of that, that extremely crazy grace bunch that are going to say, you don't do anything. You're under grace. No, 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 no. If I'm under grace, I'm doing all kinds of good stuff. I'm doing all kinds of things that demonstrate God's working in me. I'm doing all kinds of things that, that what, are fruit or works meet of righteousness. My works demonstrate that there is a right relationship between me and my Father. The things that I do are a sign and a demonstration that he's working in me. Amen. Hallelujah. So when we tell people, you don't do anything, you just lay down because your grace is on. No, that's, that's, that's crazy. No, because you know, Jesus said, what's the first thing he told the disciples to do after he, he, you know, he said, go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These signs follow them that believe. You're supposed to be doing stuff. You're supposed to be showing that Jesus is alive on the inside. You're supposed to be demonstrating the reality of the resurrection of Christ on the inside of you. I'm telling you, if you came to Jesus and you're still acting the way you did before, you need to either check up on how you came to him or stop listening to some dumb preacher who don't know what he's talking about. And start listening to those who tell you to act like you're supposed to act. What's that? You're supposed to act like the Bible tells you to act. Not to try to get to God, but because God got to you. He's on the inside of you. Amen. And if, if I've had a radical change, then the way I live and act ought to happen. It ought to be different. Can I get three holy grunts? Can I get a help me, Jesus? A... Ah! Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So when God comes into us, so we, we, we've been born again. We're new creatures in Christ. We've got the life of God on the inside of us. That, re, that substitutionary work of Christ has transformed our spirit, man. And now we dive into the Word of God as newborn babes that we that desire the sincere milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. And then we come a full age and we, we, we're rightly discerning good and evil. We're rightly discerning the Word of God. We're doing the things God wants us to do. We become mature Christians as we grow in Christ. Glory to God. But every step of the way, we're becoming more and more like Him. Hallelujah. We're putting off the old man and putting on the new glory to God we're acting like there has been a transformation on the inside of us hallelujah called the new birth hallelujah I'm not as good as I once was when I was younger I could take a tw 28 ounce I used to make 28 ounce Dr. Peppers with a screw top on them glass bottle screw top I put that bad boy up and take it right on down 28 ounces there was a long burp afterwards. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I don't do that anymore. Six ounces, I'm going, 
Can I come up for air? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So, the precious blood of Christ. See, he purchased our redemption. He calls us to be, when we come to him, you know, Paul wrote to the church and said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the better phraseology. Now, understand, King James is a one word for one word translation. There are times that the Greek needs more words. But that, so they would just try to choose the best word. Okay? So, uh, the, really, the, the phraseology in the Greek where it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, really the Greek bears it out more like this, that Jesus is Lord. In other words, you're confessing or declaring his lordship over your life. Now, that does not mean, you know, listen, we, we, we do this. We've said this in church. Lord, save me. Forgive me my sins. But Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 8, 9, and 10, he said that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus or declare that he is your Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So truly the believer becomes born again, not because you wouldn't confess all your sins. You couldn't confess them all anyway. There's stuff you done forgot about that your mama forgot about, your grandmama forgot about. Somebody remembered it, but you, nobody remembers you know of. You couldn't confess all your sin. And we do that in the church, and I, and, and, and the, I get it, but the, truly the Bible says if you'll confess Jesus as Lord. So what, what confession does a sinner have to get him saved? That Jesus is his Lord. And believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you make the confession, you believe in the heart, you get born again. What confession does the believer make? 1 John 1, 9, if we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. What happens? After you say that you sin, you confess it to God to get it cleansed. You can't bring back all the stuff you did before you got saved. You can't do it. Now, there are people teaching that 1 John 1, 9 doesn't belong to the believer. There are people there teaching about to get rid of Peter, James, and John because they don't agree with Paul. You know what? When people say stuff like that and say start wanting to tear stuff out of the Bible, run. Turn, run. Find the remote if you're watching at home. Turn the TV off. Yeah, but they got a cool television set. Turn the TV off. Just because, you know, listen, television becomes bigger than life. How many, you know, you, know, you look at people on television and you think they're this and all that, then you find out what they really are. They're whoremongers. Come on now, they're drug addicts. They're all kinds of stuff. But they, but they made a good movie. Okay, so they made a good movie. That doesn't make them an authority on anything. As a matter of fact, most of the time they're authority on nothing. We just had, we had two, two shows, three shows, Council North Carolina, because we passed a law that says men can't go in the bathroom with little girls. That's an anti-LBGT law. No, it's not. How many of you want your daughter in there with some guy watching her strip down from taking her swimming class? Because he says he identifies as a woman. Well, that would never happen. It just happened in another state. Guy was, if they asked him to leave three times, no, I, the law says I can use whatever bathroom I identify with. And he waited till the little girls came back from their swimming, I'm talking about eight, nine, ten-year-olds, from their swimming class and sat there while they were stripping down to change back into their regular clothes as a man. Because he said he identified as a woman. Well, you got stars. See, they don't know nothing. Just sing your music and leave everything else alone. And, of course, some of the music ain't worth anything anymore either. You know, you're, you're a has-been. You were a has-been before you were a has-been. Yeah, and Ringo was the worst Beatle. <laughs> He's the one that had to have to keep the rhythm, but he wasn't any good Beatle, was he? No, all right. So we, we've had, you know, several things canceled. Just because it's on television, don't make it right. How many of you seen that commercial, you know, and the girl's out there and she's waiting, her friend comes by and says, what are you doing? I'm waiting for my, my date to show up. Well, well really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's a French model. Well, how do you know? It says so on the internet. And this goofy slob, I don't know how to say, a goofy slob shows up with his messenger bag, not even the right way, shows up, comes walking up like, you know, I mean, like he's half gorilla or something. And he walks up to her and goes, bonjour. She says, see, I told you, and walks off with him. Like the other guy said, you know, it, uh, the, everything on the Internet is true. Abraham Lincoln was, was the author of that statement. You can trust everything on the Internet because it's true. Abraham Lincoln. Now, I'm saying all that to say this. Just because somebody's on television, just because they say they're a Christian, just because they say they're a preacher, doesn't mean you sit there and take it in like a bird waiting for mama to show up with a worm. 
You've got to prove things out with the Word of God. And people are saying stuff right now because it brings in a lot of money, gets a lot of people followed because they all feel good. They're all sitting around singing Kumbaya, and nobody's challenging them to say, no, this is wrong behavior. Not to make you feel bad, not to condemn you, but to point you in the right direction. Now, how many have ever used a table saw before? Do you all know what that little plastic or metal thing is on top of the table saw? It's called a guard. Do you know why it's there? So you will retain your fingers. Hello. But what does about 95% of people do with the guard? They go get a, they go get a, a, a socket and a pair of wrench and, and take it off. Why? Because it gets in the way. It slows them down. Well, my, 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 my wife's dad had a friend who worked for the East Carolina Carpentry Department. And uh, he'd been a carpenter for years. Came by the house one day and his hand was bandaged up down to here. I mean, big old baby. Go, what happened? Well, going across the table saw, and it, it, it bit and drug, and my hand went right across the top of it and split it wide open. Guess what was on every table saw the next day? All the guards were back on all the table saws. Now, you know, the OSHA investigation was going to get them for that. They were going to get busted on that one. You know, people lost fingers because the guards weren't there. Okay? See, there are protections for you as a believer. You have to stay with the Word of God. The whole counsel of the Word of God. Just because somebody puts on the, the, the preacher voice and goes, nah, 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 doesn't mean that they're right. Just because there's a book in the Christian bookstore doesn't mean it's accurate. The final authority is the Word of God with the anointing of the Holy Ghost helping you, the teacher helping you understand it. You cannot just take an isolated Scripture and run off the deep end with it. You'll get in trouble. You'll get in big trouble. People have done it all the time. we got whole denominations built on, you know, the, uh, in my name you baptize them. And they, you know, are you baptized in the name of Jesus only? If you're not, you ain't saved. I do pre I, I've heard one preacher finally say one time, he said, if they come to me and want to be baptized, I baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize. He gets them anyway coming and going. He gets them all. Hallelujah. But you've got whole denominations built on one isolated scripture. We've got to have the whole Bible. We have the counsel of the Holy Ghost. You see? And we can't jump on messages because somebody's on television and they sell lots of books and everybody wants to go hear them preach. A lot of people want to hear people preach because it makes them feel good. I'm telling you, if the truth is preached and the truth calls you to grow, in the end, you won't only feel good, you'll be stable and strong. Now, it may not be good in the first part when you find out stuff you don't like. Hello? I hear people say, whether I give or not, God's going to bless me. Really? Yeah, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that says, God give, gives to every man uh, according to what he gives. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give begrudgingly or necessity. In that same passage, he says this. He says, you know, he says, they that sow sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. So what's that tell me? You've got you to gotta put some seed in the ground to get a harvest. If you don't put anything in the ground, I'll tell you what you're going to get. Chick weed, briar weed, weed, not weed weed, but all kinds of weeds. You better not be getting any of that wacky weed. All right? But all kinds of stuff will start showing up in there. I'm, if you don't tend your garden, you don't watch your garden, you don't plant the right, you're, you're not going to get tomatoes if you don't put tomato seed in the ground. Now, we grow cabbage collards. We're Eastern Carolina, down east. We, grow, we get cabbage collars down. They've got, they got about 10,000 seeds. Little bitty things. Now, last year we didn't grow any. We hadn't planted any this year. Guess what we didn't get? We hadn't gotten out in our yard. There ain't a collard plant out there. When we grow our, our garden, no, there ain't a. But now I tell you what there is. There's some weeds. There's some of them nasty weeds. They get, they get big. They get big stalks on them and all this kind of stuff. You know? And they got, they're hairy. That's right. They're hairy. You grab a hold of them. They got those little, those little thorny things all in them. You know, got to wear gloves just to pull. And when you pull them up, you better you, you better been working out. I mean, they got root system that's amazing. You got to plant the right stuff to get the right harvest. Now I said all that because you got people teaching things that aren't accurate concerning righteousness, who we are in Christ, doing right works, and that kind of thing. Now where do where do have works meet for righteousness? We are to be holy as God commands us holy. Here's the beautiful thing.
Christ made the provision in his substitutionary work, and by him indwelling us, he empowers us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Glory to God. I got someone on the inside that gives me the power to do what God demands of me. Before, I didn't have that. I, God demanded it. God expected it. God wanted it. I couldn't do it. But now that I've come to Christ, now that the greater one's on the inside of me, now that I got the Holy Ghost, glory to God, on living on the inside of me, I can do what God said do. I can be holy as he is holy not because i'm somebody's greater but the greater one's on the inside of me and i can let him take over and i cooperate with him hallelujah and he leads me in the right ways i'm not trying to figure out how to get it done on my own but he's not doing it for me hello god doesn't do it for you he doesn't knock you down and he doesn't throw some kind of thing called grace all out. Listen, I'm not mocking grace. I believe grace is a powerful subject. It's central to the New Testament. But he doesn't throw his grace all over you. You're hopping all like you're just doing everything like you're supposed to do. It doesn't happen that way. And you're foolish if you think it is. And if somebody's teaching you that, stop listening to them. The grace of God does empower you. The grace of God's there to help you. The grace of God's there to provide you with what you need to make, get the job done. But you know what? You can bring me all the sheetrock tools you want to bring me. Put the sheetrock in the house. Mix the mud up. Have it the nails, the screws, the, the sheetrock uh, screwer. I mean, the, the nice ones that have the tape with all the screws. And you just go, yink, 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 yink. You don't even have to pick up the screw. It's just all just running through there. Oh, praise God. Never had gotten to use those before. Now that all the screws are on tape, and they just run through it and line it up automatically. You just, and all you got to do is hit it, pull it back, hit it again. Just put it right where you're going. Yeah, I like all that kind of stuff. It's like a nail gun. You go, chuk, 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 chuk. that's a whole lot better than going, wham, and hitting your thumb. And your <laughs> I've hit my thumb more than once. Hallelujah. Yep. I finally figured out that when they said hit, drive the nail, they were talking about the steel one and not this one. But it took me a long time to get there. Hallelujah. I tried a few of the other nails too. So maybe that's, that's not the right one, you know. Wham! I don't the right one either. They can bring all those tools and put them in a house. And you go lay down on the floor and say, Grace is going to hang the sheetrock. No, it's not. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to put what's provided there. Hello? And helpers have come. But helpers are called helpers. Why? Because they help. Did it say the doers have come? Did the Bible ever say the doers? You know, the Bible says the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. Greek word made up of three different Greek words means takes hold together with against. Now, if I ask you to come help me move furniture and I go sit down on the couch, you ain't helping me. You're doing. God's work in you by the blood of Jesus, by the substitutionary work, has empowered you to, to work and have the Holy Spirit work in you and with you to help you walk out the walk that he's called you to walk in. To be holy, to live holy, to live right, to live upright before the Lord. It's not a matter of you getting it done all by yourself. He's there to help you. Oh, thank God. Say, thank God he's there to help me. See, when you reach the point, you can't get it done. You, well, I can't get, I can't, oh, but thank God the helper's there. I said, thank God the helper's there. Amen? Amen. He help us. He helps us because we don't know how to pray as we ought. The King James says there in, in Romans chapter, uh, I believe, 8. And I left my notes so long ago, I don't know how to get back to them. Is that a shocker to anybody? Anybody shocked? Anybody surprised? Anybody know what happens when I say I'm getting ready to close? Well, I got rebuked about that the other day by one of my preachers. I said, you know, so if, you, if you say that, then you're wrong. I, said, I'm, I'm gonna have to, I think Doug Jones said, I got to start closing when I say I'm going to close. So I'm commencing to begin to start to think about <laughs> closing. <laughs> Hallelujah. No. We have been substituted for. And the demands and the commands of God are no, not grievous. They are not weights on us that we cannot achieve. They are there, and the power of God is in us to empower us to do what God called us to do. We can honor and please God. And I know every, everybody that loves Jesus wants to please him, wants to honor him, wants to be pleasing in his sight. Glory to God. And we do that by letting what Jesus did at the cross work in us. We cooperate with it. 
We carry it out. We don't do it to try to get to God. We do it, again, like I said earlier, we do it because God got to us. And now we walk with Him. And we commune with Him. And we carry out His purpose and plan and do fulfill His purpose and destiny for our life. In Jesus' name. Amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.